Welcome, church. I hope you're having a great Sunday. We want to thank everyone who's joining us for a service this morning or whenever you're watching our video. Just a couple of reminders. We do have Zoom Bible class starting every Sunday at 9.30. Class will start at 9.45, but the first 15 minutes are a great time to get on and chat with people. And I think a lot of people enjoyed last week getting on early just to see everyone. Also, I want to thank everyone who helped this week with their prayers, with the singing group, with the Lord's Supper. I'm so thankful for everyone who's willing to participate at this time. Also, we do have some exciting news. On September 13th, we will start meeting back in person for service. That is September 13th. Class will be at 9.30 and service will be at 10.30. We will still broadcast our services on Facebook Live, but just to let you know, you can come back to church starting on September 13th. More information is in the bulletin. And without further ado, let's begin our worship this morning. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Hi Church, today I'll be starting off with a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for today, thank you for this beautiful day. Help everyone to make the right decisions and be grateful for everything that you've given us. Thank you for everyone who's serving our country and who served our country. In Jesus' name, amen. Sin to hide, but 
that you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. For gift of love they crucified, they laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the holy Lamb of God. O wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the holy Lamb of God. O wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ the Lamb of God. Our Father, our God, we come before you this day, Father, so grateful, so thankful, Father, for the many, many blessings that we receive. But Father, we're so grateful that you loved us so much that you sent your Son to this earth. And he went to that cross, Father, and was nailed to that cross. And pray as we partake of this loaf this morning, Father, which represents his body, that we each take it in a way that's well-pleasing, Father, and we let our minds go back to that day that this sacrifice was made for each of us. In Christ's name we pray. Father, we come before you again, and so grateful and thankful, Father, that you loved us and gave your Son, and thankful, Father, that his blood was shed for our sins, Father. Pray, Father, we will always be mindful of his body being nailed to that cross and his blood shed, and as we do this, please let us, Father, let our minds go back to that day that our Savior Jesus Christ died on that cross for our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. my 
shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver. Psalm 40. For the director of music, of David, a psalm. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you plan for us. None can compare with you, for I too speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Good morning, church. I hope you've had a great week. I hope over the past week you were able to spend some time thinking about God's promises and what that means for you. And I hope that each and every day we are living out God's promises as a part of our pandemic practices. Two friends were getting ready to go to Sunday morning service. After they got ready, they drove to church, they parked their car, and they entered the building and were greeted by some members. As they made their way into the auditorium, they started talking to some friends they hadn't seen over the past week. And as worship began, they found their seats and began to worship God. They sang some songs, they listened to prayers, they took the Lord's Supper, and then afterwards, the preacher got up and began to give a lesson on patience. He had some really good points, he had some good stories, he read from the Bible, and when he was done, there was another song or two, and then there was a closing prayer, and the service was over. After service, the two friends went to go talk to some people and they decided they would go out to lunch with their friends. And so they got in their car and they were driving on their way to lunch and they were just talking about service and what they thought it was like. The first friend said to the other, they said, hey, you know, I really liked service today. And I really liked what the preacher had to say about patience this morning. The other friend said, yeah, I thought he had some really good points. But personally for me, he was about five minutes too long and now we're not going to be able to make it in time for lunch and we're going to have to wait to get our seats. The one friend had completely missed the point about being patient this morning at their service. One of the pandemic practices that I want us to look at this morning is, if you couldn't guess it, patience. We hear this phrase often that patience is a virtue, but we might not really know what that means. Patience is incredibly important for our world right now because everyone is often impatient. I'm impatient with people from time to time, and I have to learn to be more patient as well. And so I want us to look at what it means to be patient this morning. And so if you want to grab your Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 29, and I want us to read verses 15 through 20. And to give us a setup, we're going to be looking at a story of Jacob this morning. You've heard the name of Jacob. He's really important in the book of Genesis. He does a lot. He teaches us many things. And this morning, the lead up to the story is that he's taken his brother's birthright and he's kind of on the run and he's fleeing. 
And as he's fleeing, he finds this beautiful woman named Rachel, and he wants to marry her. And luckily for him, Rachel's father is his uncle Laban. And so he goes to Laban and says, hey, Laban, I want to marry Rachel. And this is what unfolds in our story this morning as we read verse 15 through 20 of Genesis chapter 29. Laban said to him, Just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you for seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed only like a few days to him because of his love for her. And so we are introduced to the story of Jacob, Laban, Leah, and Rachel. And Jacob's character is about to be tested with what's about to unfold. And so what we're going to learn is that Laban is treacherous and he's a little bit greedy. Because Laban has two daughters. He has Leah and Rachel. And what we read from the story is that Leah has weak eyes, but Rachel is beautiful in form. And so what we learn is that if you read this passage from a lot of other different translations, they have a different interpretation for what weak eyes mean. From what I've read, it pretty much means that as Jacob looked at Leah, he saw that her eyes had no passion. And so although Rachel had looks, Leah had personality. But it doesn't get quite much better from there. Because even the names Leah and Rachel respectively mean cow and ew. And not ew as in gross, but ew as in like a baby lamb. So we have the one who has no passion and personality, and we have one who's beautiful in form. And we have the one whose name means cow, and the one whose name means lamb. And so although as much as we often say, well, it's not about looks that matter, it's all about your personality, that doesn't seem to be the case here for Leah. And so Jacob looks at Rachel and says, I love you, you are beautiful, and I want to marry you. And so Jacob works out an agreement with Laban. He says, I'll work for you for seven years in order to marry Rachel. And I think Jacob teaches us a lot about patience this morning. Because first of all, when we're really interested in something, when we really want something, we have to learn to be patient and wait for it. Because Jacob could have made this agreement with Laban and said, you know what, Laban, I've worked for you for seven days, and that feels like seven years to me so you should just give me Rachel and we can go about our ways but he continued to work hard he was still patient and he waited for the outcome that he was hoping and I think Jacob teaches us a lot about perspective because when we really want something we have to be willing to wait we can't be impatient and say well I want it now I want it just to be over with I want it to have it so just give it to me but he waited seven years for Rachel and that's hard for me because I can barely wait seven minutes on the drive to Walmart to get my groceries. <laughs> but Jacob teaches us that it's important to wait. Patience is an important virtue. Patience is an important quality that we need to have in our lives. As we have to learn to be patient people, God wants us to be patient in all aspects of our lives and with him and with everyone. I'm reminded of Lamentations chapter 3 where it says, The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And as Lamentations is talking about, it's good for us to wait for God's salvation. It's good for us to wait on the promises he have. We have to be learned to be patient with him and to be patient with others. Patience is a fruit of of the spirit and if we want to be fruitful in our lives we need to take a bite out of the patience fruit this morning because we hear this phrase often patience is a virtue but what does that really mean there are so many quotes about there about patience one person says patience is the key to everything you get the chicken by hatching the egg not by smashing it 
Well, I guess that makes sense. Another person once said, patience is not the ability to wait, but the ability to keep a good attitude while waiting. And so patience might not not more about be about action, but just about the attitude behind our actions. The phrase patience is the, is the virtue is believed to be dated back all the way to the third and fourth century. And it was believed to have been first said by a man named Cato the Elder, who was a warrior and a soldier and a historian. And he happened to write this phrase of human virtues, patience is the most important. So if patience is one of the most important virtues and it wasn't written until the third or fourth century, I guess for the first few thousand years, patience didn't matter at all. But we have to learn to be patient this morning. And as we learned from the first few verses that we read out of our story in Genesis, God is teaching us to be patient. Jacob is teaching us to be patient. And what I first want to take away from this morning is we have to learn to be patient regardless of our circumstances and regardless of the time it takes. Patience is something that takes a long time to master, but it can be worth it in the end. And Jacob was patient for Rachel for seven years. He didn't know what was going to happen in those seven years, but he continued to work hard and he continued to trust that no matter the outcome, he was going to wait for it and that it was going to be good. In a minute, we're about to read Genesis 29 verses 25 through 30, but to kind of catch us up on what happens in the middle, Jacob works for Laban for seven years and he's promised to get Rachel. And so after the seven years, he gathers everyone together for this big feast and for a big wedding. And somehow in some way on the wedding night, Laban trades out Rachel for Leah because the custom was that no matter what, the older daughter got married first. And so since Leah was the older daughter, she was the one to be married first, not Rachel. And so this is what happens on the, on the morning after the wedding. This is what Jacob wakes up to when he realizes that he's been married to Leah and not Rachel. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? I served for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, finish this daughter's bridal week. Then we will give you the younger daughter one also in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter to Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant Bilhah to his mother Rachel as her attendant. And so when Jacob realizes he didn't marry Rachel and he married Leah, he was upset. He was frustrated because he wanted Rachel all along. He worked seven years for that to happen and it didn't work out. And I think Jacob teaches us a lot about patience here. Because Laban had other motives in this. He knew he wasn't going to give his younger daughter away before his older daughter. And so he changed something up. He duped him. He changed out Leah, Rachel for Leah at the last second. And he says, you know what? Jacob, I'll still give you Rachel, the one you really want. But you're going to have to work another seven years for me. And obviously in this passage we can see Jacob's frustrated. And you know, he could have said, you know what, Laban, I'm done. I worked seven years for this, so you're going to give me Rachel, and I guess I'll take Leah as well, and we're just going to go and we're going to move on. But that's not what happened. He chose to be patient, and he worked for another seven years. And in this passage, I think Jacob's teaching us that we have to be patient regardless of the outcome that's going on. Even though he was frustrated, he acknowledged his frustrations in being patient. He waited for what he thought was going to be the outcome he wanted, but it wasn't. But yet he still worked hard, and he chose to be patient for another seven years. And he continued to change his perspective on what he saw and what was going on. He chose to change how he felt about his emotions and said, you know what? I'm going to continue to be patient. I'm going to continue to wait even though this is not what I wanted to happen. Patience requires us to wait. Patience requires us to wait on God's timing. Because just like in the story, I think God was teaching 
Jacob patience even though he's not mentioned. And in our world, God is teaching us to be patient. We have to wait on God's timing. Because God's timing is perfect. He is not early, he is not late, but he brings about his promises at the perfect time. Just how we talked about last week about God's promises. He does follow through. But when we think about patience, we have to learn to wait on God and wait on others. Patience teaches us to rely on God and his power and his timing. And patience reveals to us God's plan because he is over everything. Patience teaches us self-control for the one who is in control of everything. Patience teaches us to be able to control our emotions instead of exploding and blowing up because we have to learn to be more patient with things. Patience goes against our natural instinct to blow up, to explode, to say, oh, I'm so frustrated, I'm so done with what's going on. Patience teaches us to remain cool, calm, and collective. Be able to see the situation for what it is, maybe change how we're seeing the situation, and it teaches us that there's something better that can happen in our situation. Patience might take a lifetime to master, but we can take steps each and every day to become more patient and become less impatient. Sometimes we might think of ourselves as those little tiny firecrackers that have the short fuse, and so as soon as you light it, you have to throw it because it's about to go off. But I want us to learn to be like those cartoon bombs that have the 20 or the 30 foot long fuses. So as soon as you light it, there's still some time before it explodes. And I want us to have those long fuses because we might realize that as we're being patient and we solve the situations in our life, that we don't have to explode. We don't have to get down to the end where there's going to be this grand eruption, but maybe we just snuff out that wick and that fuse that's about to go off. Patience teaches us that there's a lot more to life. It teaches us self-control, and it helps us deal with our emotions. And so just as we read in that story in Genesis about Jacob, he was patient for seven years. And I think we should be learned to be patient or for seven more seconds or for seven more minutes. Because we have to learn to be patient. And so what I want us to do this morning is learn to be more patient. And the way that you can learn to be more patient is just to identify the triggers that happen in your life that make you be less patient. Identify the things that just tick and pick away at you and learn to remove them or remove yourself from the situation so you can become a more patient person and so that you can be better to deal with others and deal with the frustrations in your life. Maybe if you're impatient this morning, maybe learn to remove yourself from the situation. Maybe you have to take a step back sometimes. We don't always have to fight and argue all the time, but maybe by taking a minute to ourselves, by stepping back this from the situation, we can step back into a place where we can solve what's going and maybe the best thing we can do this morning to change ourselves and become more patient is to change how we see the situation. The best thing we can do is gain perspective on what's really going on. Because maybe as we're getting frustrated, there's other things that are affecting us. There are other things that are going on that are causing us to become so shaken and we're becoming more anxious. And so maybe we have to see what's really going on in the situation. Maybe we have to gain from perspective so we can be more patient. I want our pandemic practice this morning to be more patient. And I want us to ask ourselves this question this morning, how can I be more patient? What do we need to do? What do I need to do to learn to be more patient? Because I really believe that if we can learn to be more patient, we'll have better control over ourselves and we'll have better control over the situations of our lives. God is with us and he's helping us become more patient. God is good to those who hope in him and who put trust in them and those who learn to wait. So this morning, let's find ways that we can be more patient. Make it your pandemic practice to become more patient this morning and each and every day going forward.
said, crucify him, he's to blame. He could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called ten thousand angels, but he died alone.
good to be with everybody here this morning at our worship hour. Uh, we've had a good lesson now. Let's, uh, would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we, we just pray that you found our worship here this morning to be favorable and that all we've said and done would be pleasing unto you. We continue to pray, dear Heavenly Father, for our church family. We pray for Bonnie Perry's mother, Dorothy, Mary and Jose Reyes, the Salceda family, and others in our family that uh, need your help. Lord, we're living in difficult times right now, and we just uh, pray for your guidance that uh, as we go through these difficult days, we pray for all those that have been affected by the coronavirus, and we pray for dear Father for all those that have been affected by the hurricane. Many have lost their homes and their businesses, and we just ask that you bless them and be with them. We pray for our country, Danny Father, for we're going through this civil unrest. And we just pray that you, you would help us replace hate with love and that we would learn to help instead of hurt. And now, Danny Father, as we leave here and go our separate ways, that you would help us to let our light shine as we live our lives and come in contact with others, that others would see Christ living in us. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.